I've been thinking about thinking. Maybe we can all identify with the uh, old fellow who remarks, sometimes I sit and think, and sometimes I just sit. Psalm 39 encouraged us to think, to think about important things, things like life and death and eternity. The world around us doesn't particularly encourage us to think deeply. The devil, the ruler of this world system, does, in fact, everything he can to keep us from thinking about serious things. He seeks to keep us amused or entertained. The enormous influence of the sports and entertainment industries bear truth to that point. I learned something interesting about the word amusement. It's actually a word of two parts. The first is the root of that word, and it's muse. And to muse means to think, or consider, or to ponder, or to meditate. But if you put A in front of it, A is a negative. So amusement means not thinking. So when we're amused, it takes our attention away from important things. We don't think. Now, there isn't anything wrong except we're amused all the time and we're, we're looking to be amused and entertained all the time. And I think that's exactly what the devil wants. Many people just drift through life, then die, never considering their final destiny. This particular psalm, Psalm 39, was written for, written by King David for one of his Levitical song leaders, a fellow named Zeduthun. He was one of three leaders. Others were Asaph and Haman. We repeatedly find these three men as song leaders throughout the Psalms. In this psalm, there are four stanzas. The first is a preface in, in verses 1 through 3. It's followed by verses 4 and 5, which states the main question that David has. This second stanza is followed by the word selah. Selah means stop. Think about it. Consider what has been said. Verses 6 to 11 form the third division and 12 to 13 the last. We find this psalm to be both, both a personal lament and also a wisdom psalm because David has a question and he's asking this question and then he gets the answer which is a wise uh, something that we need to understand and God wants us to know what these things are saying. This psalm brings to mind a couple of other places in Scripture. One, Job, and his questioning about God and what he's doing and, and why he's doing what he's doing. And then also Solomon, as he considered life and came up with the idea that apart from God, everything is vanity. So let's stop. Let's start looking at this psalm. Looking at Psalm at number, the first couple letters, working. We find here in verses 1 through 3, David's burning question. I said, I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. I'll guard my mouth as with a muzzle, while the wicked are in my presence. So I was mute, and I was silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. Let's stop just for a minute. We see that David has a problem. He has a burning question in his heart. A question, God, what is going on? I don't understand. And I'm troubled by it. 
verse 3 says, My heart was hot within me, and I was musing as a fire burned. So there's a burning question within him. Now some speculate that David was in a period of sickness. Verse 10 says, Remove your plague or scourge from me. So that may be metaphorical, or it might actually be that something was wrong. Whatever the situation is, I think that David is realizing he's getting older. And he's thinking about missed opportunities. You know, many people reach middle age, their 40s, their 50s, and they're disappointed that they haven't been able to accomplish what they thought maybe they would in their lives. Their dreams lie fresh under the obligations of just making a living and surviving. Life seems to have passed them by. But we all wonder about what the Lord is doing in the ups and downs of life. And there's a burning question in David's heart. But it's one that needs to be carefully handled. It isn't something to share openly with the wicked, those unrighteous people who don't follow God, because these people lack spiritual discernment. They might take it wrong. Sometimes it's better to be silent about our questions. There are some things that we can learn from this verse, and just the principle of being, being silent. Sometimes it is better to be silent about our questions about God, especially to those who don't know God around us. Our words of complaint might be taken as criticism of God, especially non-believers. Our words of complaint might be taken as criticism of God. Even with other believers, our complaints might discourage people instead of encourage them. But we should first bring our complaints to God. Then we can share the others with renewed perspective. So David sealed his lead, his lips, he kept his thoughts to himself, but his complaints and his questions didn't go away. I'll just kind of ignore them. You know, sometimes we say, well, I'll just I'll just kind of put that on the back burner and, and maybe bring it up later. And, uh, but it didn't go away. Because this was an important question. His complaint just kept burning away inside. And they finally surfaced in the right place. He voices his complaint to God. That forms a second stanza of this psalm. And by the way, the numerous lament psalms, and there are a lot of them. I mean, it seems like there are more lament psalms than about any other kind of psalm. Psalms of complaining. God, how long? God, what are you doing? You know what that teaches us? It teaches us it's okay to complain to God. Not to others, but to complain to God. You know what? He can handle it. He doesn't get mad when we complain to him and say, God, I don't understand. Teach me. Teach me wisdom. Help me handle this. And God said, that's why I sent that trial in your life, so you would come to me. For to limit our complaining to others, but God welcomes our honesty. Telling us, telling him of our frustration, telling him of our confusion, our pain, and our searching, and asking God help. So let's go on. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. It says, Lord, make me know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Selah. Stop and think about that. David asked, why is life so short? Why do the days pass so quickly? 
I'm not sure it is at, at what age we started thinking about how fast time passes. I know when I was in school and, and summertime came, I was sure that summer passed a whole lot faster than the rest of the year. I think it slowed down in January. January and February is kind of dragged along. Somebody said the only good thing about February is it keeps January from bumping into March. But I think this complaint speaks more of the deep concern about getting older, realizing opportunities may have been missed. It's the concerning alarm that life is so short. Many of us keep so busy as time that time passes unnoticed until something makes us stop and think. And David is saying, Lord, my life is going by so quickly. It doesn't seem to be slowing down. My life is short, I'm getting older, and I don't like it. Where did time go? And why, God, did you make things this way, that, that things go by so quickly? You know, Psalm 103, 15 and 16 very clearly states this. It said, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes, but the wind passes over it, and it's no more. And his place acknowledges it no longer. I think that our problem is compounded by our tendency to live for the future. I was thinking back on my life, when I was a teenager, a young teenager, I couldn't wait until I turned 16 and got my driver's license. And then I couldn't wait until I graduated from high school. And then I couldn't wait until I reached the legal age of 21 and graduated from college. And then I couldn't wait until I got that first job and then the promotions. I remember turning, anticipating turning 25 because my car insurance was going to go down. We live for the day and we find that one special person and, and we fall in love and get married and, and the, then we look forward to the day we have children and then when we have children we look for the time that they're out of diapers. Well, won't that be great? When they're potty trained. And then when they're in school, and I'll have a little bit more freedom. And finally, the kids grow up for a retirement time. So. And we miss the joy of each day because we're always looking forward, always looking for the next big thing that's going to happen. And I think David is there. And I think he's saying, wisdom is grasping the joy of each day. There's a Latin carpe diem that means live for the day, grasp the day, enjoy the day. David is realizing it makes him sad almost to the point of despair. William Shakespeare captured this, and you'll probably recognize this quote. It's from a speech of Macbeth. When he says, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour on the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's what the world says. David, I think, was feeling a little bit of that. But then, he realizes that life, that God is in control, and God has this designated life to be short, like a breath, or like a hand span, four fingers. That's the title, four-fingered life. The span of the hand was the shortest measurement that they used. They used the, the span of the hand, four fingers, about three and a half inches, or if your hand is bigger, four inches. But my life is like that. The smallest 
participation. We live a four-fingered life. And then he requests, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom to understand and accept this difficult truth. You know, Psalm 90, another wisdom psalm written by Moses, we read, Teach us to number our days so that we may present and gain a heart of wisdom. Teach me to number my days so I can present a heart of wisdom. Verses 6 and 7. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and doesn't know who's going to gather them. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. David finds that compared to God, our significance is very small. But that we find significance in our relationship with Him. And our hope is in Him. He realizes how unimportant He is how insignificant he is in comparison to God. Even as a king of Israel, he realizes how insignificant in comparison to God. He sees that our lives are like a phantom without God's perspective and value. A phantom is defined as something apparent sense with no substantial existence. You know, it reminds me of Fireworks. You go to the fireworks store and you buy, you know, a big, important looking thing and you set it off and there's a flash, a loud boom, some pretty sparkles, a puff of smoke, and it's gone. That's it. There's nothing that lasts on a firework. That's kind of like how David sees life. It's kind of like Solomon said, vanity, 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 all is vanity. You know, I enjoy going to estate sales. I love to look for bargains and inexpensive treasures. But estate sales are kind of sad. Because you see, all these things that were so important to people, and now they're going to go to this person or that person and probably don't understand how important that was to that person. You know, it's sad but true that even our children aren't interested in most of our stuff. You know, how many times have you been to an estate sale or you've been to a garage sale and you see a beautiful set of china? That China that was so important when you got married and you got piece by piece by people and or maybe you inherited it from grandma and, and uh, you kind of ask your kids, you know, well, who wants my set of China? And they all kind of look for work. You know, it's not important anymore. Things have changed. This too is vanity. Someone inquired after John D. Rockefeller died and said, how much did he leave? And the answer was all of it. He left it all. Now, so far, this has been pretty depressing. True, but depressing. But in verse 7, we gain perspective. We gain wisdom. What am I looking for? What does all this mean? What's the significance of my short life? And the answer is, my hope is in you. God gives significance to life. You see, life is, while my life is short, God is eternal. And I move from shape, from thinking about short, from short term, my life, to eternity. And we realize that God has put eternity in our hearts. And that we are made for eternity. And the hope of the gospel is that life goes on after death. 
this life is just the first chapter of a book that goes on and on and on forever. Jesus conquered death. He's the firstborn, the first of many of us who will experience the resurrection. Let's read on. Verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is, it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me. Because of the opposition of your hand, I'm perishing. With reproofs, you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what's precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. We find in these verses an important principle of wisdom and also a warning. And the warning is that sin is the great spoiler. Sin is what limits our life. All the negative things that we encounter are because of sin, or the effects of sin, death, disease, aging, wickedness of the society around us. All of that is because of sin. We die because of sin. That's all the fruit of sin. But there's something much more important, or as important anyway. And this is that sin has a great effect on believers. Sin robs us of opportunities. The opportunities of life. The opportunities to serve God. The quant look, look at David's life, his later life. His sin with Bathsheba, adultery, and then murder of her husband, Uriah, destroyed his family. If you read the latter chap chapters in 2 Samuel, you'll see how his family fell apart. Sin in our lives breaks both that perfect fellowship between us and God. And if sin remains unconfessed, then, then God lovingly disciplines us, trying to gain our attention. And if we stay in a state of rebellion, joy and peace are gone. We lose the desire to sought to serve God. And opportunities to do significant things for God are lost. And it's stated in verse 11, with reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity, you consume as a moth what's precious to him. Surely every man is a mere friend. And that's the result of unconfessed sin in the life of a Christian. You know, we all have a limited number of days, but time lost can never be regained. Those chances to do significant things for God. As we think about God reproving us, it raises another important question. Why does God bother? If we're so insignificant compared to His greatness, why does God bother to discipline us? Does God, why does God even care for what I do? I found something that could state it much better than myself, a quote by James Montgomery Boyce. And he says, The answer, of course, is the very paradox of human existence. Namely, that although man is a passing creature who often does merely strut and fret his short hour upon life's stage, he is more than a passing creature of an earthly day. He is made for eternity. For God himself. Therefore what happens to him and in him, as well as what's done by him, though of short temporal duration, has eternal value. And this is the point of God's rebukes and discipline. What God is making of men and women now is forever. What we do now matters. We're made for eternity. And God's loving discipline proves He cares deeply about each one of us. And we ask, God, 
I am so insignificant compared to you and compared to everything. I'm just a, a tiny little dot here on earth among six, seven billion people. Why do you care about me? And God says, that's the point. I do care about you. You are important. Your decisions are important. Your life is important. The choices you make are important because they're going to stay with you for all eternity. Maybe you've heard the saying. Maybe you have it on a cross stitch on your wall or a plaque that says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You see, this world is not our home. The last verses of this psalm say, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears. For I am like a stranger with you, a sojourner like all of my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart and end no more. Ends with a prayer. And we find that the psalmist has regained his perspective in thinking. The first thing we see is a confession. A confession of what? The psalmist is confessing that I've been looking at my life in too short of a time frame. Instead of eternity, I'm looking at it right now and I'm saying, why is it so short? And God says, it isn't short, it's just, it's just the first chapter. It's going to go on forever. He recognizes his wrong perspectives, perspective that is distant himself from God. And he asked that God would lift his heavy hand of discipline so he can be happy before he dies. And Job said the same thing. In Job 10, he says, Turn away from me so I can have a moment of joy before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and deep shadow. In times of distress, perhaps we've had the same thoughts, but it's a much better way of thinking. Perhaps all his questions have not been answered, but... David does recognize the meaning of life is found in knowing and serving God. Bottom line. Bottom line. That's the reason for life. That is the purpose for life. Knowing and serving God. Everything else is secondary. Gaining possessions, gaining stuff, all those other things lie better, just empty vanity in the final evaluation. So how do we consider ourselves? Sojourners, travelers. The world is not home. We're on our way home. We are heavenly citizens and we need to live with heaven on our mind instead of considering this is all there is. Hebrews 11 13 and 14 says all these died by faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the world on the earth. But those who say such things make clear that they're seeking a country of their own. Throughout the Bible, we find the pilgrim principle. This world is temporary. We're just passing through. We're seeking a permanent home and a new heaven and a new earth. Recreated by God, free from sin, free from all of the effects of sin. And our purpose in life is to come to know God, to have our sins forgiven, to gain the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, and then live lives of service, experiencing the abundant life from God's perspective. That's the meaning of life. To know and serve the Lord. Father, we get so distracted 
we get so busy. But Father, in this song, you have called us to stop and think, to consider what life is all about, what death that we all will experience unless you return. We're all going to experience that. And Father, to consider do we have a relationship with you? And then Father, to understand that life is all about a relationship with you. Experiencing the joy and the fulfillment and the joy of service to you. Everything else is secondary. Father, we acknowledge that this is the truth. And help us to live by it. As sojourners, as pilgrims. And we thank you that through your spirit you can give us that perspective. Teach us, Lord, a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.